On this episode of Twill, the buddies of Budgie have released a new version of the Budgie desktop. Ubuntu has announced some ambitious goals for their next release of the distro. The Flat Hub has hit a major milestone. OpenSUSE is getting geared up for the OpenSUSE conference. And plus, we have some news about Purism making some waves with an announcement of their first public offering for some reason. All of this and more on this episode of This Week in Linux, your source for Linux good news. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Linbit. More on them later. The buddies of Budgie have released a new version of the Budgie desktop with Budgie 10.9. They also made a blog post talking about like a look back year in review type of thing for 2023, as well as their goals for 2024. I'll have all of this linked in the show notes if you'd like to check it out for yourself. But let's talk about some highlights. Now, we're not going to talk about the... 2023 stuff because there's a lot of improvements and new features that were added to Budgie in 2023. And we've already talked about that when they were released. So you can check out episode 218 and 234 to see the news in 10.7 and 10.8 of Budgie respectively. So I have those linked in the show notes. Now let's talk about the new release of Budgie with 10.9. The biggest change for this is Budgie 10.9 having initial Wayland support by porting several components and applets to the libxfce4 windowing library. This is an abstraction library created by the XFCE desktop team. And they say in this announcement post, a quote from Joshua Strobel says, while libxfce4 windowing is act under active development and not yet ABI stable, we choose to already adopt it to make the transition from Budgie 10 under X11 to Budgie 10 under Wayland as seamless as possible. And also goes on to quote saying, LibXFCE4 windowing enables us to port functionality to support Wayland without negatively impacting use under X11. Now, that's some really good news. And it also makes you think about, like, what is, what is the plans for Budgie 11? So they're aiming for full Wayland support to be in Budgie 11, but they're also working on an in-house Wayland compositor that we talked about in episode 231 of Twill called Magpie. So there's a lot of plans for the Budgie desktop both with the X, X11 support of the 10 point, 10 point series, also the Wayland support of the 10 point series, and the uh, Budgie 11 support. So there's a lot of work going on there. They also, this release also introduces a redesigned Bluetooth applet that now provides direct connect and disconnect functionality for paired Bluetooth devices, battery life indicators, and a new functionality that lets you send files to your Bluetooth devices, which is really cool. And their plans for 2024 is, of course, improving X Wayland support. And in second half of 2024, they hope to have a Budgie 10 that is Wayland only, which will be very interesting. And then this is probably not going to be like a production ready thing, but maybe who knows? Uh, but I'm very interested in that, as well as they're working on the support for the next generation of Budgie, which is Budgie 11 which will probably using the EFL stuff, which is the and Enlightenment Foundation Libraries. And this is we talked about this in a previous episode. I'll have that linked in the show notes too if you'd like to learn more about that. There's a lot of stuff moving here, uh, so we can't cover everything, but I think this is a really good news for the Budgie Desktop. And for those who have not tried the Budgie Desktop, I highly recommend it. You can check out Solus or Ubuntu Budgie or uh, Bud uh, Fedora Budgie. There's a lot of cool stuff in Budgie. So if you've never tried it before, I highly recommend you check it out. And if you'd like to learn more about this news or any of the things we talked about already from the previous episodes, I have links to all of that in the show notes. We've got some very interesting news for Ubuntu users related to the next release of Ubuntu, which will be in the April of this year with 2404 LTS. There are a couple of things that Ubuntu appears to have planned for the next release, which also happens to be an LTS, like I mentioned. So these are even more ambitious than they would be normally because this is an LTS and they usually play it safe on LTS releases. So we're talking about changes to the kernel. So the Ubuntu 2404 is expected to be shipping with the Linux 6.8 kernel. Now the current kernel is 6.7. The current LTS kernel is Linux 6.6. .6, so it looks like they're going to be a bit aggressive here because Linux 6.8 is expected to be released in March, and that is very close to the release date of April for Ubuntu 2404. So I'm very curious to see if this happens. It would be very interesting and also double interesting because it's an LTS release. And on top of that, Ubuntu is considering applying low latency optimizations to its kernel, and these changes are mostly config options that occur on boot, and this is going to be really interesting to see if they do this, especially for an LTS. 
Now, speaking of Ubuntu, you should also check out the episode of Destination Linux we just released, episode 356, where we talk about the Snaps format from Ubuntu. We discuss whether it's helping Linux or if it's a snap apocalypse. Or <laughs> anyway, check it out, destinationlinux.net slash 356. And if you'd like to learn more about this latest news regarding the Ubuntu 2404 LTS release, you'll find links in the show notes. We have a couple of items for OpenSUSE this week, starting off with the OpenSUSE conference. They have released some travel details related to OpenSUSE conference. And first, it's taking place in Nuremberg, Germany in June, on June 27th through the 29th. You may need to get a formal invitation letter, though, for potential having a, a visa, depending on where you're traveling from. Uh, there'll be an email that you can contact to get that invitation letter. And also, if you are a contributor to OpenSUSE, you can even use the travel support program that they offer, which will pay up to 80% of the travel and the lodging to go to the OpenSUSE conference, which is pretty cool. I did not know about that part about OpenSUSE paying for that. So that's pretty cool. And if you are not a contributor, you might want to consider becoming a contributor if you would like to go to the conference. Also, let's talk about OpenSUSE Tumbleweed. So OpenSUSE Tumbleweed has got a lot of updates this month, uh, updates to the kernels, updates to Firefox, KDE frameworks, Mesa drivers, SystemD, uh, GStreamer, Samba, and so much more. Uh, but I also wanted to talk about the fact that they have changed the way they're releasing information about Tumbleweed because I had a little bit of participation in this because the OpenSUSE Tumbleweed project is awesome. It is a rolling release distribution that has snapshotting so you can roll back and all sorts of stuff. It's a very, very cool uh, option from OpenSUSE. But the problem is that I hardly ever talk about it on this show because they would basically update every day and change stuff all the time and it was hard to keep track of it. And I requested that they change their blog post to being, instead of as frequent as it was, to being once a month so that we could talk about it more often and more specifically. And they have done that, which is awesome. So it, maybe it's part of my suggestion. Maybe they were already thinking about it. Who knows? But the fact that they're doing it is great because you'll hear more about OpenSUSE going forward because Tumbleweed is where they do all the development, all the innovative stuff, and there's a lot of stuff to talk about, especially coming up on the end of this month in February, because I assume we're going to be talking about Plasma 6 at that point. And yeah, I can't wait for that. Anyway, if you'd like to learn more about the OpenSUSE conference or OpenSUSE Tumbleweed, you can check the links in the show notes. So the FlatHub team has announced some exciting numbers related to the usage of this Flatpak store with reaching a big milestone. According to their data, they are now having over 1 million active users using FlatHub, serving over 1.6 billion downloads, over 2.4 thousand apps. More than 850 of those apps are verified. And this is just great news because, first of all, the Flatpak format is a very important thing because the universal formats in Linux is very important. So I'm happy to see that. And also the massive uses of FlatHub is really good because when Flatpak was first announced, there was no central way to get any Flatpaks. So almost no one ever used it for at least a year. And uh, there was even a point where I kind of made a joke. There was only like 14 Flatpaks at the time. And why would anybody use it? And now we're, you know, fast forward a few years and we're at a point where there's over a million active users. And that's awesome. So fantastic news there. They also provided some potential reasons they think that the growth happened. First of all, having popular apps like Firefox, Chrome, Discord, Spotify, and Zoom being easy to install via the Flatpaks is probably one of them. I agree with that. They also introduced the verified app system, which they say makes the system more trustworthy. And I think that that's also true. But the verified apps, for those who don't know, is basically just the app is managed and maintained by the official developers of the app. So it's not necessarily like verified to be good or verified to be the best thing or whatever, that sort of thing. It just means that it's verified that the people who are making the flat pack are also the people who make the application, which is very important. I'm glad they did that because it used to be quite hard to tell. <laughs> so very good news uh, that, 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 that it's probably helping, I mean. And also the Steam Deck, that's probably helping too because the default way to get applications on the Steam Deck is via the FlatHub, as well as many, many more things such as the adoption of Flatpaks and FlatHub in Linux uh, and just various distributions, I mean, and so that sort of stuff. So just really good news overall. And I'm happy to hear that for the FlatHub as well as, you know, just 
let you know that I like flat packs myself. If you have not tried flat packs, you should definitely try it. And if you haven't tried flat packs, what are you using right now? Very curious. And if you'd like to learn more, links in the show notes. There's a new version of the System Rescue project with System Rescue 11. For those unfamiliar, System Rescue is a system rescue toolkit available as a bootable medium for administrating or repairing your system and data after a crash. It can be used for both Linux and Windows systems and comes with tools such as Gparted, FS Archiver, as well as basic file system tools and other tools. This update to, has an update to the kernel for Linux 6.6 LTS. It adds an option for SSH known hosts in its YAML config. It updates the XFCE desktop that it uses, and it also has replaced the DSTAT package with Dual or D-O-O-L, and adds bcachefs-tools, block sync-fast, which is for block-based backups, sleuth kit for a raw file system inspection, time shift for other backups, as well as many bug fixes and that sort of thing. If you'd like to learn more about System Rescue 11, you'll find links in the show notes. A new version of Red Core Linux has been released with version 2401 or 2401. Now, of course, it's based on the fact that it was released in January of 2024, but they don't have a indicator of a switch like that. It's just 2401, so 2401. For those unfamiliar, Red Core Linux is a rolling release distribution based on Gentoo. It gives you a quick a way of installing a Gentoo system without having to do with compiling, provides repos with binary packages and that sort of thing. Now, we did talk about recently that Twill, on Twill, that the Gentoo distribution is now adding binary packages, but Red Core has been around for a while and the Gentoo thing is a recent change. So if you are interested in that, you still might want to check out Red Core just to uh, compare and that sort of thing. Uh, also, with this release of version 2401, has been announced with new changes to uh, resync the Gentoo's uh, testing tree up to the latest date of uh, January 21st. Also, it ships the LTS kernel of 6.6. Pipewire is now the default audio system. Open SSL has been updated from version 1 to version 3. FFmpeg got updated from version 4 to version 6. And Landlock LSM is now enabled on the kernel. They've also made some changes to the custom pa package manager that Redcord has called Sisyphus, which is an interesting name for a package manager. And it's been the backend has been completely rewritten and now provides suggestions for misspelled packages and many, many more. And, and if you'd like to check out more details about the latest release of Redcore Linux, you'll find links in the show notes. This episode of Twill is brought to you by Linbit. Linbit has been keeping digital businesses running for over 20 years. They're the makers of open source products like DRBD, which is high availability software that has been part of the Linux kernel since 2010, and LinStore, industry-leading open source software-defined storage. Linbit has an active presence in the open source community as well because they collaborate with the community to help identify and build new features to their products. Limbit provides enterprise-grade software that runs on a variety of platforms without vendor lock-in, which is really cool because no matter what your OS is and no matter what kind of hardware you want to use, including off-the-shelf hardware, you're good to go with DRBD and LinStore. And also with DRBD and LinStore, you can have high-speed replicated block storage in almost any configuration, whether it's Kubernetes, Apache Cloud, or Open Nebula. There's even DRBD proxy for long-distance replication. Linbit provides really awesome services like DRBD, and DRBD is a really good way to make sure you have good data recovery and backups. And if you ever have like a cluster with multiple nodes and one of those nodes fa fails, you can have rest assurance that the backup nodes will have the data that you want. So if you're interested in checking out any of the software from Linbit, I highly recommend it. So go to linbit.com to check it out. That's L-I-N-B-I-T.com. The Endeavor OS team have announced a new version of their distro with Endeavor OS Galileo Neo. Endeavor OS is a distribution designed to provide an easy to use Arch experience with an easy installer and great system management tools. And also this is a maintenance update, so there's no big changes, but they have updated the kernel to Linux 6.7. Calamari's has been updated. Firefox has been updated to the latest version of 122. The Mesa drivers have been updated. Xorg server, NVIDIA DKMs, as well as many more things, including also bug fixes related to Wayland, live environment issues, and they've also made some changes and improvements to the Calamari's installer. 
So if you'd like to learn more about this latest release of Endeavor OS, you'll find links in the show notes. The Qualys team is at it again, finding vulnerabilities. A new set of vulnerabilities have been found inside of glibc, and they've confirmed to be exploitable on Debian 12, Ubuntu 23.04, 23.10, Fedora 37 through 39, and I'm sure there's probably other ones as well. There has been four significant vulnerabilities found in this batch, um, the most dangerous one allowing local privilege escalation, enabling an unprivileged user to gain full root access. Not good. Now, this is based on having a heap-based buffer overflow exploit, an integer overflow exploit in the vsyslog internal function, a memory corruption issue found in the qsort function. And while these vulnerabilities are notable, it's also important to note that they are local exploits, so you would need physical access to the computer in order to exploit them, and it is not an ex remote execution issue, so it could be much worse. I know it sounds bad, but it could definitely be much worse. So I just wanted to talk about this because a lot of times people will see vulnerability in Linux and they just attack it because anytime that there's a vulnerability in Linux, it's notable because with Windows, it happens every day. And with Linux, it's not that common. And with remote executions, it's very, very, very rare. So I just wanted to point that out. And also, most importantly, these glibc issues have already been updated and they've patched these uh, vulnerabilities. So users just need to make sure that they keep their system up to date to receive these security patches. If you'd like to learn more about this news, you'll find links in the show notes. Purism has announced their first public offering of Purism stock on the Start Engine platform. They're aiming to raise money at a 75 million USD valuation for the company. They're basing their self-assessed $75 million valuation on a 9.15 times revenue multiplier. Now, this is not that unheard of because 10 times multiplier is also not unheard of in some industries, but it depends on the industry. But there's some things that you should know about this if you ever decide to, or if you're considering doing it. Now, this is not financial advice. It's just my opinion related to the company, their products, and that sort of stuff. Now, their SEC filing justifies this based on comparing Purism with two tech-based companies and their agreements during the acquisition of those companies. Now, what companies are you talking about? Well, Google acquiring Android for $50 million in 2005, and apparently Purism is comparing their efforts with Librem 5's Pure OS to the early state of Android at its time of acquisition, which, you know, you might think, what? Well, it gets better because the other justification that they offered is that IBM acquired Red Hat for 10 times revenue in 2019. And they go on to note that both Red Hat and Purism are the top five contributor to the GTK toolkit, and they both invest in the Linux desktop. And my response to that is, um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're saying Purism is the equivalent of Google and Android and uh, Purism is equivalent to Red Hat. Uh, I'm gonna have to disagree there. But uh, for those unfamiliar, Purism does not have the best reputation. So yeah, I was laughing because uh, I'm very familiar with this company. It used to be a company that people wanted to be successful, and I wanted it to be successful. But after failing to meet promises that they were crowdfunding, reports of refusing to give refunds to customers, and their products being described in the most generous way as underwhelming, the first time I covered Purism on this show, I was optimistic, but that was many years ago, and that's not happening today. I don't like to cover topics on this show that are negative most of the time because I, I prefer to just talk about things that I like or I find interesting because it's just not my style to talk about things that are negative. But this company is such a mess, in my opinion, that it's kind of funny. So with this, they also put out some of their financial information, which is Interesting because it includes revenue and sales for 2022, which were $8.1 million. And they're using that as the multiplier for the 10 times thing or 9.15 times. So, but also there's cost of goods that were sold. So there's a 4.2 million cost. So it's not like, that, it's not a net revenue. This is a gross revenue. In fact, they did also inform give information about the net income and also their debts. So they have 6.7 million in short-term short debt and 15.1 million in long-term debt. And in 2022, the net income was negative 478,000, which is better than the 2021, which was negative 2.7 million. 
So speaking of this uh, attempt to get some public offering stock sort of thing, Purism has now crossed over $100,000 in stock buying, whatever, in fewer than 48 hours. And that's interesting. But I also am wondering how, why? So to give you some context, let's talk about some of their devices. Now, in my opinion, the products that they offer and the services that they offer are not worth paying for. Just, just That's just my opinion. So let's talk about specifically the phones that they offer because that's what they're mostly known for. That's how they got big and popular in 2017 when they did the crowdfunder and that sort of thing. So let's talk about that. Now, and I've done some research except for the server because I don't really know what to compare it to. But in my opinion, based on my research, there are product, products that are cheaper and better for all of their product line. But let's talk about the phones. So Librem 5 has a NXP IMX8M processor, which was released in 2017. It comes with three gigs of RAM and it has a storage of 32 gigs. Now let's compare it to the Liberty phone, which has the exact same processor. And this is also their phone, by the way. Librem 5 is their non-US made version. And the Liberty phone is the US made version. The Liberty phone has four gigs of RAM, which is one gig more, and has 128 gigs of storage, which is an improvement, but kind of like the baseline these days. So the Librem, the Librem 5 is $1,000. It's $999, but there's plus tax. So we're just going to say $1,000, right? Uh, plus the Liberty phone is twice that, $2,000 for one gig of extra RAM and the same processor. Now let's compare it to something else. Now, I'm not gonna talk about like all the massive mainstream flagship phones. We're just gonna talk about phones that are related to the Librem phone. So we have the PinePhone Pro, for example. It has the Rockchip RK3399S, which was released in 2021, which is much more recent than 2017. It comes with four gigs of RAM, which is the same as the Liberty phone, that was $2,000. And it has 128 gigs of storage, which is the same as the Liberty phone for $2,000. And it comes in at $400. So significantly cheaper. But you might be thinking, well, that doesn't have all the features that the, the Librem 5 has, such as you know being easily removing the, the battery or changing the hardware configurations and stuff like that. And and having a micro SD card, yeah, it has all those. It does. But sure, it's not made in the USA, so if you want to compare it to the Librem 5, it's still a more powerful device with more storage, a newer processor, and it costs much, much less. So let's talk about another option. There's the Fairphone. And if you're in the US, you can get the Fairphone 4 from Marina. We actually had Marina on an episode of Destination Linux. If I'd learn more about them and the EOS operating system and the stuff they do, it's very interesting. So check that out. I have that linked in the show notes. But the, the Marina Fairphone 4 has a Qualcomm Snapdragon 750G, which was released in 2020. It comes with six gigs of RAM, 128 gig storage, and comes in at $550. And if you get a Fairphone 5, because if you're not in the US, you can go to, like, to get it some like the European people can get it. And unfortunately, we can't get the Fairphone 5 yet, but hopefully that, com that comes soon. Uh, but again, the point is more powerful and cheaper. But let's you know have a little bit of fun with this, right? Let's, let's kind of go a little farther. Let's compare the Liberty phone with a massive flagship phone that everybody knows is overpriced. It's super expensive for no reason. You can't justify it. It's, I mean, people, it's, it's not the highest RAM. It's not the highest storage. It's not the most powerful CPU, yet people still buy it. And then other people argue that it's overpriced. And we're talking about, of course, the iPhone. Of course, we're talking about the iPhone. So the iPhone 15 Pro Max, I went on their website. I maxed out everything I could, which is not a lot, but you can get an eight gigabyte RAM phone with the A17 CPU, which is made by Apple, and the one, one terabyte storage, all of this for $1,600. Now, why am I talking about the iPhone? Well, the excessively overpriced phone that people think is not powerful enough to justify its price is twice the RAM and a lot more 
a terabyte, you know, it's a terabyte. It's a lot more storage, a lot more powerful, and it costs $400 cheaper than the Liberty phone. Just keep that in mind. So if you would like to check out the public offering of Leap Purism, feel free to do so. I'll have links in the show notes, but also maybe check out anything that compares to their products because in my opinion, I don't get it. I'm very curious uh, if you want to, why you'd want to. Also, I'm kind of curious how this company still exists after years and years of this. So if you know, please let me know because I'm very curious. And in the meantime, links in the show notes. Let's talk about SDL. For those unfamiliar, SDL, or the Simple Direct Media Layer, is a cross-platform development library designed to provide low-level access to audio, keyboard, mouse, joystick, and graphics hardware via OpenGL and Direct3D. It is used for video playback software, emulators, and many, many games. I mean, in some way or another, SDL is used by most games, whether it's for direct uh, input access or audio access or just something else. You know, there's a lot of stuff that depend on it. Now, SDL 3.0 has been in development for a while, and recently there have been some exciting work done for this project. Uh, Sam Lantinga, I, I probably said that wrong, so sorry if I did, of Valve has submitted a lot of cool stuff recently, such as code that adds in RGB and YCBCR color types to the SDL interface, color ranges, and other color space properties. Also, Sam has added some code for HDR support, such as adding HDR surface properties and tone mapping from HDR to SDR, as well as adding support for other HDR color primaries. Just super interesting. And all of these have been merged just this past week. So if you'd like to learn more about SDL or this work that has been done by Valve, you can check out the link in the show notes. UB Ports has announced the latest release of their Ubuntu Touch mobile operating system with the fourth over-the-air or OTA update. It's available on a variety of devices from the Fairphone and Pinephone to OnePlus and the Volophone. Contains Ubuntu 20.04 security updates. You can now hide notification content while locked. It now shows estimated charging time. Theme switching is now built into settings without needing an external app. And you can now set uh, contact-specific ringtones, as well as there is now a dialog to allow USB debugging when you plug in a phone for the first time to a computer, and many bug fixes and that sort of thing. And I know this might seem like it's not that kind of a big deal because these seem like basic features, but creating a mobile operating system is a lot of work. And with a small team, it's even more work. So this is truly impressive from the UB Ports team. So just very cool. And if you'd like to learn more about it, UB Ports or Ubuntu Touch or that kind of thing, check out the link in the show notes. There's a new release for the Shotcut video editor with version 24.01. For those unfamiliar with this application, Shotcut is a free open source cross-platform video editor. It has a lot of powerful features and unique approaches to video editing. And Shotcut is also made by the same developers who make the MLT framework, which is used in pretty much every video editor on Linux. Now, some of the brand new features include clip grouping, split at playhead now supports multiple selections, undo and redo support for filters, auto backups for projects, which is awesome, and a copy button to text viewer dialogues. Uh, Also, there is a timeline improvement such as set loop range, split all tracks at playhead, nudging forward and backwards, and many more. And finally, there have been a number of bug fixes and other smaller enhancements and that sort of thing. So if you'd like to learn more about Shotcut and give it a shot, Uh, give it a shot cut. That was bad. (laughs) You can check out the links in the show notes. Now, the next topic is something I just think is interesting. It's not necessarily related to Linux, but I think it's an interesting topic. So the FTC has found that Intuit was violating US law over TurboTax advertising. So the FTC saying that it's because of their TurboTax free service. The FTC says that Intuit engaged in deceptive advertising in violation of the FTC Act and deceived customers when it ran ads for free tax products and services which many consumers were ineligible for. TurboTax often has ads about how you can file for free with their service, and apparently it only applies to simple taxes and doesn't cover all that many people. That's what FTC is saying. Now, the FTC commissioners have voted three to zero to uphold an order prohibiting Intuit from advertising that their products are free without stating that it's not free for the majority of customers. 
And Intuit has responded saying that commissioners for the U.S. Federal Trade Commission unsurprisingly announced that they have ruled in favor of themselves in a lawsuit filed against Intuit. Intuit is immediately appealing this decision, and we believe that when the matter ultimately returns to a neutral body, we will prevail. Now, Intuit defends its practices, saying it's helped more than 124 million Americans file their taxes free of charge and has always been clear, fair, and transparent with its customers and is committed to free tax preparation. I wonder how many years it took for them to get that number to accumulate to 124 million because the, the American population is over 330 million. I'm just curious. Obviously, it's not that many using it, but I wonder. Anyway. Plus, tax preparation in the U.S. is a very big business, which is why our system is hot garbage. You might be wondering, why am I covering this on the show? Well, it's just interesting, and I thought you might like to know. Because in the U.S., it's the tax season now. While I know this is not that relevant and it's not that interesting to a lot of people, I find it interesting, and I'll give you the reason why. It's because that the United States is one of the few countries on the planet where taxpayers have to guess what taxes they owe. I've talked to many people on this topic from many different countries over the years, and it's usually a bit shocking for them. So I wanted to give you a quick breakdown of how it works here. In a lot of countries, the government calculates how much each citizen owes in taxes and then tells them to pay that amount. Then the citizen can submit deductions back in order to uh, lower their tax burden and that sort of thing. And this is fair. It's a fair way to do it. This is not how it works here, though. In the USA, the government calculates how much each citizen owes in taxes and then tells no one. We, we have to guess how much we owe and hope we're right. Imagine ordering a pizza, and when the delivery person arrives and you say, how much do I owe you? They say, guess. And then you have to itemize the amount of pepperonis on the pizza multiplied by the weight of the cheese plus the amount of scoops of the sauce, and then you offer your guess, and they say, you're wrong, you're going to jail. Okay, it's not that bad. You might get a fine first, but people have gone to jail for taxes and that sort of stuff. But it's just, it's super confusing because in the same way you wouldn't know how much cheese and sauce is used in a pizza, you also have no idea how the government is calculating your taxes and you're just hoping for the best. So it's funny to me when people talk about how they're doing so much good for the American people and they're making money off this horrible tax system when for decades politicians have attempted to fix the horrible tax system. And I'm pretty sure there's been some companies who didn't like that idea because they wouldn't be able to make money because it's so confusing. People just pay, pay them to do it. So uh, that's just my theory here. I'm not saying that's true for Intuit or whatever, but you know, who knows? But that's how it works here. And if you're from a country with a reasonable system and one of your American friends complains about taxes, well, now you know that you can sympathize with them. So instead of having an oh, American of complaining about taxes, there's a reason. No one understands it and no one has any idea how much they owe. And if you accidentally pay more, well, that's it. <laughs> if you'd like to learn more about this news, you can find links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on the show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in the Linux and open source world, then be sure to subscribe. And of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership, where you can get a bunch of cool perks like access to the patron-only sections of our Discord server and much, much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux Everywhere t-shirt, the one I'm wearing right now, and the This Week in Linux shirt at tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there, you can check out all the other cool stuff we have, like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and much more at tuxdigital.com slash store. I'll see you next time for another episode of Your Source for Linux Good News. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tanell. I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring that notification bell. And until next time, I bid you farewell.